Hi, I'm Dustin Abbott, and I'm here today to give you my final verdict on Canon's new EOS Rebel SL2, or also known as the 200D or the KISS X9 uh, in various markets around the world. And for some reason, uh, Canon likes to give uh, some of its models different designations in different zones around the world. So um, this is actually my first time with the SL series. The SL1 uh, came out several years ago and it just didn't, never really landed on my radar. But as I look back at the release of the SL1, I think that the SL2 um, comes to the market with a few extra challenges that the SL1 didn't have. A big part of that is the fact that when the SL1 was released, you know, it had fewer competitors really. Um, at that point, the mirrorless market wasn't nearly as saturated. And for those that were interested in sticking with a Canon product, you know, Canon's EOS M line was really still in its infancy and didn't necessarily have a whole lot to offer, either in terms of a lens lineup or really in the performance of the camera itself. The SL2, however, comes to, a, comes to the market in a period where there's a whole lot more competition. And most manufacturers have started to really mature some of their mirrorless options including Canon itself. And I think in a lot of ways, the, the top competitor to this particular camera, for those that are interested in a Canon product, although they're not necessarily at the same price point, is the, uh, either the Canon EOS M5 or an equivalent type camera. Canon has somewhat s standardized its uh, performance across its APS-C cameras with the current 24 megapixel sensor, which you know has seen some improvements. And of course, with the ADD, took a step forward when it comes to the dynamic range and the absolute performance of the the sensor itself. And it is a great sensor. And the sensor inside the Rebel SL2 or the 200D, it is an excellent sensor. That being said, it's not going to be differentiated by that sensor because basically if you're buying any of Canon's current you know, APS-C products, you're going to get the same sensor. And so that really kind of makes a buying choice more about the ergonomics, more about perhaps the, um, the feature set that's included and the price and less about the absolute performance of the camera, at least as far as the sensor goes, because with a few subtle differences, you're getting pretty much the same thing across the board. On top of that, there are a number of the features that have also been standardized in recent releases in that they're starting to see uh, getting Canon's outstanding DPAF um, uh, contrast autofocus system, you know, what you might refer to as live view, and with it, of course, some really good AF servo tracking um, in, you know, both stills performance and video performance. And that's a great feature, but of course, it's a feature that is shared across a number of different camera bodies. On top of that, of course, they've also started to debut another video feature, and that's, uh, you know, an a uh, digital image stabilizing system um, that helps with video footage to get more stable footage. And again, it's a nice feature, but it is also one that is going to be available pretty much whatever product that you choose across the current lineup. Let's take a look then, if, if it's, it's about ergonomics, let's take a look at the pros and cons of the ergonomics of this particular camera. Uh, when it comes to the way that it feels in the hand, while of course it's on the small side, and if you have small hands, um, it may feel fantastic in your hands. For my hands, of course, it is on the small side, but at the same time, I will recognize that it has a pretty outstanding feeling grip that contours nice to the fingers. I've got, you know, kind of uh, doesn't, it's not as wide as my hand, but for what I am hanging on to, I have a nice solid feel there and uh, you know the biggest I think advantage when it comes to the actual handling comes down to it having you know Canon's outstanding they call it a very angle or fully articulating LCD touchscreen that really is exceptional and I like it in all the ways that it's been applied and of course it's certainly very nice here and really the back is dominated by that very large LCD screen and so a lot of your features end up getting mapped to that what I'm not crazy about when it comes to that ergonomic design is that, you know, by default, you have a lot of those position, those things that are shown on there. But um, if you actually go to try to change a setting, you're going to have to first hit the Q button for anything to happen. And um, I just find that because it's displayed there, it feels like you should be able to go ahead and touch something when you've brought that up as far as with the dis display, but you have to first hit the Q button before you can actually change any settings. And of course, that's there to help to uh, 
stop you from inadvertently uh, causing any of those setting things, but it can be a little bit disconcerting. Also, if you're an experienced Canon shooter, you may be put off initially by the um, very kind of generic hand-holding type menus. Good news is, is that it's kind of a two-tier menu system on this, and you do have the option of defeating all of those um, kind of hand-holding things and just going to a straight-up Canon menu that you are familiar with. And so if you're accessing that traditional Canon menu system, you will be able to find most of the settings you are familiar with. Uh, I do find that there are more that are just stuck under the heading of custom functions and what I would like, and it's not maybe broken down into as many categories. And so there's actually 11 different windows there. So it can take you a while to go through, you know, screen after screen after screen, trying to find what you're looking for. But overall, of course, Canon's menus really are laid out quite well. They're intuitive, they're easy to use. And if you're not really familiar with how settings affect each other you do have that option of enabling those uh, those features and and so it will say things like shooting screen or menu display mode guide feature guide and so you have an option of either allowing or disabling all of those things you have a standard or a guided mode that will kind of uh, tell you what everything does and so if you're not comfortable with that those features actually will be a positive for you for me they got in the way but of course I'm an experienced shooter and and so I, I disabled all those and things got better for me. In terms of the actual handling of the camera, I'm really, really missing not having a secondary dial on the camera. And uh, when it comes to a comparison to, for example, the EOS M5, the ergonomics on the EOS M5 are fantastic. They really are like using a professional level DSLR in terms of the, all the options that are there, the, the modes, the dials, and so it's great. Um, I really find I'm somewhat limited with this and I find that it's taken me much longer than what I would like to get at the, the settings that I want. Um, for example, the rocker uh, menu on the back, um, even the the Rebel series, the Rebel series will have, it doesn't have a, a, a wheel back there, but it has a directional pad that's labeled with what each direction does. On the SL2, you really don't have that. You have a directional pad, but there's not anything that's kind of automatically quickly assigned to it. So it means that for, you know, those that you know, would like more functionality there, it means that they're going to have to be able to program in what they would like those functions to do. And I'm just, you know, I think that that might, you know, kind of stretch the capabilities of some of the designated kind of audience for this particular camera. And so I just have to say that I don't love the ergonomics of it. I just find that I'm, I'm kind of hunting to do what I want to do. And so I don't love that. AF system is another area that I, I think, frankly, is a is, is disappointing in 2017. It has only nine selectable AF points. The AF point spread is fairly decent, but of course you're gonna have some tracking challenges in that you only have nine points that have a fair bit of space in between them. And so the handoff might be a little bit difficult if you're trying to go from one point to another with the tracking. The other thing that I'm not crazy about with the autofocus system is the fact that you can't calibrate any of your lenses. Now, that's true, of course, for the Rebel series pretty much in general, um, but I do find it a pretty serious liability these days in that, you know, if your lens has some front or back focus issues, you're kind of stuck with it. And, you know, for example, the if you're going to a mirrorless type system, the M5, for example, or any of the EOS M cameras, you're not really having to worry about autofocus calibration in the same way. I recognize that the M5 is at a different price point. Um, it is in the $900 to $950 range, whereas this camera can be had for $550 is what it goes for. And so, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a fairly significant difference. However, it is my opinion that a lot of shooters might be considering this camera might be better served saving a little bit extra and going to the M5 and will just have a better experience. But let me give you some reasons to choose the M5 and some reasons to choose the SL2 instead. As far as the M5 goes, I would definitely say that I prefer the ergonomics of the M5. As I said, it does everything that I want it to, and it has a couple of really nice features. For example, if you're looking through the viewfinder, you can do the touch and grab where you're actually using your thumb on the LCD screen to move a focus point around that allows you to just really quickly place it where you want it to. Um, you certainly don't have that kind of flexibility here. The one that place that I would say that the ergonomics are better on the SL2 is that it has the fully articulating screen. And so uh, those that are vloggers may prefer the SL2 for the fact that you can turn that screen around to face you. And uh, whereas 
with the M5 because its EVF is at the top. It's only a tilting screen and it will rotate down. Rotating down prevents, presents a bit of a problem because there's blockage if you have anything on the tripod mount. And so um, you may prefer if you're a vlogger or you, you know, you're wanting to use kind of a selfie mode more often, you may prefer the SL2's ergonomic simply for that fantastic articulating LCD screen. Uh, another reason to consider the M5 is that you have a access to a lot more lens options, including all of the EFM mount lenses. And that's not just the native Canon mount, but there's some really excellent prime lenses, for example, from some other companies that I have reviewed um, for the specifically for the EFM. And, and frankly, in EFS, you know, Canon mount, you really don't have a lot of great prime options. Um, and there's actually much more available for the EFM mount. There's also a, a greater variety of very compact lenses that are specifically designed for very small systems. And so if your goal is to go small and light, you have more options on the mirrorless end than what you do um, with the SL2. Uh, the one place where I will say that that I will make an exception to the rule is if you're wanting to adapt um, EF or EFS lenses, um, it's actually, obviously there's no adapting here on the SL2, whereas because of the difference in the flange distance, the, you know, and that's just basically the distance between where the lens ends and the sensor is, it requires some extra spacing on a mirrorless body. And so you have to use that adapter and the adapter will add you know, in the case of using some of Canon's pancake lenses, it basically doubles the length of those. And so in that situation, you'll have a more compact experience using the SL2 if you're using one of Canon's, you know, pancake lenses. But remember, there's only a, just a few of those. And so it's not like you're, you're talking about a lot of different lenses. Um, and of course, with the, you know, the EOS M5, you also do have the advantage of not only the native EFM mount type lenses, but you also have obviously the access to using most all of the EF, EFS lenses via adapter. Um, but again, one advantage for the SL2 is that you do get some varied performance when you're adapting lenses, whereas with the SL2, you're going to get the straight up kind of native performance when it comes to autofocus speed without some of the occasional quirks that can come in. And Canon's made a lot of progress with that, but you know, I still think that you're going to get better performance, you know, using phase detect, that's viewfinder AF with native mount lenses. Um, however, the EVF, the electronic viewfinder in the M5, gives you a lot of different options. And so it makes it a much better option for shooting manual focus glass, for example, or adapting vintage lenses, which I like to do, you know, or lenses from other systems, where if you're just using manual focus, you can magnify that image in the viewfinder, you can put an overlay that will show you kind of edges when things come into focus. You just have some extra options, some manual focus aids there that you don't have. Um, in the the in the SL2 and so you know there are some versatility that comes with having an EVF there the other thing as I've already mentioned with the contrast AF that's the uh, autofocus type system that's in mirrorless you don't really have to worry about lens calibration whereas here you don't even have the option of calibrating lenses if they don't happen or if they do happen to have some front or back focus Another thing is that if you want to shoot action at all, um, the M5 is a much better option it, um, just because of the fact that it has a much faster burst rate. It's not even in the same category. It has a burst rate of 9 frames per second, um, whereas the SL2 is poking along at 5 frames per second. And so we're talking nearly double the uh, frame rate with the M5. You know, on the, the advantage side of the SL2, is that you do have both phase detect autofocus through the viewfinder. And then of course you have pretty much the same autofocus system that the EOS M5 has if you're shooting in live view. DPAF system works really, really well. It's super fast. You know, you can do touch screen um, or, you know, just automatically shoot, or you can opt to just, you know, touch to focus, but then, you know, to shoot differently. But anyway, you have, you basically have kind of the best of both worlds, although the viewfinder AF is not the best of anything. The other thing to consider when it comes to the SL2 is that, yes, it's a nice compact light camera. Um, and, you know, and it's, it's basically, now it's a bit lighter than what even the M5 is, um, you know, in, in pretty much the same kind of form factor. But, you know, it's not incredibly smaller because it's larger than what the SL1 was. It's not actually incredibly smaller than what the current, say, T6i or 800D is. 
And then so, you know, the 800D is 120 grams more and it's just slightly larger. And so, you know, this camera is compact, but it's not like it's pocketable. And so I think that, you know, the size advantage has somewhat been lost. And of course, the when it comes to the the 800D or, you know, T7i, it's got a much more robust AF system. It's not all that much more expensive and you could still get like a T6i that still has a more robust 19 point AF system. The very angle screen, you know, as I said, features have pretty much been standardized and the T7i has been bumped up to a 45 AF, AF point system. And so it's going to be much better if you're wanting to, you know, to track things or, you know, shoot more action oriented. And so to me, the SL2 occupies a pretty precarious position in that it's it's kind of squeezed on both sides both by the mirrorless side but then also just by the rebel series because other than being a little bit lighter and a little bit more compact it really offers up nothing else unique to it whereas mirrorless does have some unique options for it now of course the one thing that it, it does well is that body only you can get it for 550 dollars you know brand new which means that once the sales pitch in it will become a very inexpensive camera and as i said image quality is great you can take a look at some of these images a variety of different lenses i'm um, including with the uh, kit lens this is a vastly improved much more solid feeling lens um, it you know it avoids some of the issues that that lens had like the front element doesn't rotate um, and so you can use, you know, circular polarizers fine. Um, beyond that, it only extends at one point in the barrel, whereas with the, the focus, you know, the older version would kind of go in and out and it just, I, I wasn't crazy about that whole system, even trying to retract it and, you know, different things. So I feel like this, this lens is a nice, it's a nice match to the camera itself. And of course it's not expensive to add that in a kit. Um, but, you know, to get the best performance out of the camera, you're going to want to move to, I would recommend if, you know, if you're buying this camera, some great lenses to consider are like the EFS 24mm f2.8. I would say even Canon's 50mm f1.8 uh, SDM lens is a nice choice. Um, also, if you're wanting a kind of a, a prime lens to use for shallow depth of field and maybe some portrait use, there's some great options out there for this and, and then some good third party options to consider as well but bottom line is is that I, I'm kind of left wondering who exactly this camera is for um, as I said because it, it doesn't really offer too much that is unique to it and there's no kind of killer app that I can point to to say wow this is a feature that you want for this and that's in large part because it has kind of the same features that a lot of other Canon cameras does, except for it also has some, uh, some more limitations to them. So really the only thing that it has going for it is that it's, it's smaller, but it's not all that much smaller. And so that kind of leaves it in an interesting position. I think for some people that have, you know, small hands and want a nicely sized, you know, travel uh, starter camera, this could be a good option for them. Uh, for those that are just looking for a compact body to bring along maybe as a secondary body for a bigger system um, It's an interesting option maybe for that um, For some people it'll be a good travel camera, but for your day-to-day -day shooting I think that there are some other options that may be a little bit more compelling and Bottom line if it were me and I wanted to buy a Canon camera that was compact and roughly the size I would save a little bit extra money and I would go for the M5 myself I'm Dustin Abbott, and if you'll look in the description down below, you can see a link to my ongoing coverage of this particular camera system, image galleries, etc. You can also find some buying links there, and of course, you can follow me on social media or become one of my patrons on my Patreon account. And if you haven't already, please click that subscribe button. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.